Good morning. I have printed the uh, various scriptural passages in my notes in large print so I can read it. Um, and uh, like a lot of people nowadays, I'm fond of the Bible app on the phone. But um, it kind of loses its uh, impact if you raise this up and say, this is our standard of truth. Uh, but uh, but I, I'm thankful for a church where the Bible is our standard of truth and that it is preached faithfully every Sunday. Uh, this Sunday, we are, of course, starting on chapter 24. And um, so if you'll turn there with me and follow along, if you can. Uh, first, though, uh, let's, let's go over a little bit of where we've been, um, particularly uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, we saw how Saul disobeyed God's instructions when he defeated the Amalekites and God rejected him from being king. Um, if you remember, he was told to uh, strike the Amalekites and to defeat defeat them and take uh, everything that they owned and destroy it and destroy every man, woman, and child in there. And they basically they disobeyed. They kept uh, King uh, Agag alive and uh, brought him back. And they they brought back all the sheep and uh, animals and that. And uh, Saul said, "Well, he told Samuel that." Uh, well, we did that so we could sacrifice those to, uh, to the Lord. And that's when Samuel said, well, you, you know, to obey is better than sacrifice. And uh, so um, on, on, you don't have to turn here unless you want to. But uh, 1 Samuel 15, starting at verse 25, Saul says, uh, So now please forgive my sin and return with me that I may worship Yahweh. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of Yahweh, and Yahweh has rejected you from being king over Israel. Then Samuel turned to go, but Saul seized the edge of his robe, and it tore. So Samuel said to him, Yahweh has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today, and has given it to your neighbor, who is better than you. And uh, this will come up again in, in our uh, chapter today. Um, on, on uh, chapter 19, verse 6, Saul swears by Yahweh that he will not harm David. And uh, only four verses later, and uh, he's back to being ready to kill David again. Um, Saul's son, Jonathan, and David uh, make a covenant together before the Lord. They, um, they are uh, best friends, as it were, and... Uh, uh, so when Saul is seeking to kill David, Jonathan helps David and David flees. And in chapter 22, um, Saul kills the priests of Yahweh and the entire town of Nob for supposedly helping David. Uh, so Saul is spiraling down, getting worse and worse. Um, so Saul pursues David near Ziph. And uh, just as he's about to catch him, uh, he has to leave off of that and, and uh, fight the Philistines. Um, so they called that place the Rock of Escape. And after successfully fighting the Philistines, Saul returns to pursuing David, who is now in En Gedi. So now we look at chapter 24. Um, starting at verse 1. Now, when Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheepfolds on the way where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the inner recesses of the cave. Then the men of David said to him, Behold, this is the day of which Yahweh said to you, Behold, I am about to give your enemy into your hand, 
and you shall do to him as it seems good in your eyes. Then David arose and cut off the edge of Saul's robe secretly. And it happened afterward that David's heart struck him because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. So he said to his men, Far be it from me because of Yahweh that I should do this thing to my Lord, the anointed of Yahweh, to send forth my hand against him since he is the anointed of Yahweh. And David tore his men to pieces with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And Saul arose, left the cave, and went on his way. Now afterward, David arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, saying, My lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the ground and prostrated himself. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men, saying, Behold, David seeks to do you evil? Behold, this day your eyes have seen that Yahweh had given you today into my hand in the cave. And some said to kill you, but my eye had pity on you. And I said, I will not send forth my hand against my Lord, for he is the anointed of Yahweh. Now, my father, see, indeed, see the edge of your robe in my hand. For in that I cut off the edge of your robe and did not kill you, know and see that there is no evil or transgression in my hand, and I have not sinned against you, though you are lying in wait for my life to take it. May Yahweh judge between you and me, and may Yahweh avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancients says, Out of the wicked comes forth wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom are you pursuing? After a dead dog? After a single flea? Therefore, Yahweh be judge and execute justice between you and me, and may he see and plead my cause and execute justice for me to escape from your hand. Now it happened that when David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? Then Saul lifted up his voice and wept. And he said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have dealt well with me, while I have dealt evil with you. And you have declared today that you have done good to me, that Yahweh surrendered me into your hand, and yet you did not kill me. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safely? May Yahweh therefore reward you with good in return for what you have done to me this day. So now behold, I know that you will surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hand. So now swear to me by Yahweh that you will not cut off my seed after me, and that you will not destroy my name from my father's household. So David swore to Saul, and Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the fortress. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. We ask that you would open our hearts and minds to understand it better and more clearly. We ask, Father, that your will will be done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Pardon me while I drink some water. Okay. It is confirmed in this chapter that Saul knows the truth, as Jonathan previously attested when he said, My father knows this. Uh, but he knows the truth that Yahweh's plan was to make David king. But Saul did not like God's plan. And uh, he was going to do all he could to bring about a different outcome. Saul's theology, his understanding of God and how God works, is very bad, to say the least. Uh, so bad as to be irrational. Uh, how can a man fight against God? Yet, as we will see, whenever circumstances seem to be moving toward, God, or toward Saul's favor, Saul strangely gives the credit to God and his blessing. Um, 1 Samuel 23, 7. Uh, then it was told Saul that David had, came, had come to Keilah. So Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand, for he shut himself in by entering a city with double gates and bars. Um, and you wonder, how, how, this, how can this be when God clearly 
plans to make David king. The God that Saul seems to believe in is more like the fickle, unpredictable pagan deities than like the one true God of Israel who never changes, never goes back on his word, and is never thwarted. Saul really seems to view God like, almost like a man on, on Saul's level, someone who may be resisted, and if resisted well enough, you might give up on a previous plan or be convinced of a better one. Um, in all this, Saul certainly does seem to believe in God, both that he is greatly interested in human events, especially those of Israel, and that he is very much involved in bringing about his desired outcomes. But unlike David, Saul does not put his trust in God, and neither does he submit his heart, soul, mind, and life to the will of God, whatever that will may be. Rather, Saul is grasping onto what he values most, his kingdom and his throne, for himself and for his posterity. So this sets up the contrasting question, what does David value most? There was another king of Israel who lived in a later time, who grasped onto his throne in the face of God's plan to make someone else king. Uh, Matthew 2.16, then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had carefully determined from the Magi. This was the same throne as Saul's and the same spirit of grasping, um, the same short-sighted and twisted thinking by which men rebel against God as if they might win. You have to wonder if Herod thought after he killed all the children, well, that takes care of that. God will just have to think of something else. Um, it, it's, very, it's very strange. But th there was one more king of Israel, and this one gave up much and did not grasp onto his own position or even his own life. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7. Have this way of thinking in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus who, although existing in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a slave by being made in the likeness of men. Um, verse 1 of uh, chapter 24. Now when Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Um, en Gedi was the name, uh, it means uh, spring of the wild goats, um, so the wilderness was named after the spring. It was generally a very rough part of the country, I'm told by various commentaries. I have not been there. And uh, lots of uh, sharp, craggy hills, many large caves, um, very large caves, some of them evidently, if they can hold 600 men. Um, verse 2, then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the rocks of the wild goats. Wow, Saul chose or took 3,000 chosen men. It means the, the best of the best in, in his army um, just to go after David. Saul knows that David, by himself with God's help, took down Goliath after all. Uh, David was undeniably a, a hero capable of miraculous feats when God was helping him. Um, perhaps Saul was taking no chances that even if David might be able to defeat many men by himself, 3,000 would be enough to overwhelm him, even with his small band of men. Saul knows that it is God's plan for David to be king, but again, pragmatic concerns carry more weight in Saul's mind than, than God's sovereignty. Such pragmatism is faithlessness. If Abraham had had the faith of Saul, he would not have been willing to sacrifice Isaac. Since Isaac's death, pragmatically speaking, would have prevented God's plan from coming to pass. In the same way, but from the other direction, Saul thinks that if he kills David, then God's plan to enthrone him will be prevented. So how can such a faithless and pragmatic man fight against God? Um, Yes, God is likely to help David in any fight against Saul, but if Saul can provide an overwhelming force, then uh, such favor of God might not be enough to save David from defeat, or so Saul might think. Uh, but we can see how sin can warp a person's thinking. Um, 
to the point of uh, even being irrational. Because to think that one can fight against God is, is, is irrational. Um, sin is called foolishness for a good reason, and there's a reason why intelligent men with sinful hearts choose actions that are not very smart. Um, sin is deceptive, and the devil is a liar. And even Satan was self-deceived in a way similar to Saul. How could a mere archangel uh, ever begin to imagine that he could defeat God? So verse 3, And he came to the sheepfolds on the way, where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the inner recesses of the cave. Some of the older commentaries interpreted this as Saul needing a nap. Um, but the newer ones make more sense and interpret this as Saul needing to use the restroom, so to speak. Uh, so here we have an awesome lesson for Saul, for David, and for us. God is in control. Uh, if David or Saul had any doubts about that, there, there's no longer room for any such doubts. The wicked king, I mean, think about this. The wicked king Saul, bent on hunting David to kill him, surrounding himself with 3,000 of the best troops just to ensure his success, is taken by God away from his men and put all alone and helpless right in the middle of David's cave with his men. It's, it's um, you know, it's almost humorous. Um, God, God is obviously in control. Uh, then the men of David, verse 4, Then the men of David said to him, Behold, this is the day of which Yahweh said to you, Behold, I am about to give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as, seems good, as it seems good in your eyes. Then David arose and cut off the edge of Saul's robe secretly. Uh, notice that both Saul and David have counselors with questionable wisdom. It's worth noting that even when everyone around us tells us something is God's will, um, and we should take the opportunity God has given us, that doesn't mean they're right. Uh, obviously, they were right that this was God's doing. But it is always dangerous to try to read God's will into the circumstances. Uh, the text doesn't tell us if perhaps God's, or perhaps David, excuse me, the text doesn't tell us if perhaps David's initial intention had been to, as he arose and headed Saul's direction, had been to kill him. Um, and the Holy Spirit, convicting his conscience, caused him at the last moment to take the corner of the robe instead. Um, we don't know. But, um, but thank God that no one's held accountable for the temptations that they almost succumbed to. Um, on the other hand, as we continue, we see that David is adamant. He will not put his hand against the Lord's anointed. Just as God is so clearly shown to be in control of the circumstances, we can rest assured that he had just as much control over David's restraint in the matter. Um, and as we will we'll see in the next chapter, David doesn't always have restraint. Um, and, it, and it happened, let's see, verse 5, and it happened afterward that David's heart struck him because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. And he said to his men, Far be it from me because of Yahweh that I should do this thing to my Lord, the anointed of Yahweh, to set, send forth my hand against him, since he is the anointed of Yahweh. And verse 7, And David tore his men to pieces with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And Saul arose, left the cave, and went on his way. Notice that while everyone else was interpreting God's will according to the circumstances, David avoids that. To where does David look to find God's will? He discerns God's will according to the principles of law and truth contained in the Bible. David knows that regardless of any circumstances, God stays true to his word and does not change. David knows that it is wrong to touch the Lord's anointed, so he would, excuse me, so that would apply even if the Lord's anointed was trying to kill him, and even if David was also anointed to replace him, and even if the wicked but anointed man was placed by God right in the middle of David and his men, circumstances change. Right and wrong do not change. Um, have you heard the expression, the cannon is closed? 
Uh, it refers to the fact that the Bible is now complete. We are not to expect any further revelation of that type from God. There is to be no additional books of the Bible, no new prophecies, etc. We are not Isaiah or Elijah and the rest who got their instructions directly from God's voice. Neither are we Gideon who laid out his fleece to get a clear signal from God. Uh, neither are we David and the priests who could use the ephod to get an answer from God to their questions. Um, we are to discern the will of God for our lives by finding in his word the principles of truth and morality that come from him, storing up that word in our hearts and then living our lives according to those principles that we might not sin against him. Uh, David was not swayed by the circumstances because he knew God's will according to God's word. When, we, uh, when Pill and I first left the military with two small children, um, we thought God had a place for us in Virginia, uh, where a couple who were good friends of ours uh, were living. We stayed with them while I looked for a job. After a month or so, when I found out what I thought, when I found what I thought was a good job, we joyfully accepted that as an answer to our fervent prayers. And I was certain that God had, by providing that job, confirmed that we were to live and raise our kids in Virginia. Um, seemed to be a nice place after all. I was praising God at church that Sunday for all of this, and within one week we were back on the road heading to Ohio. The job was gone through no fault of my own. And uh, so what happened to God's will? Um, it's simple. I had wrongly read God's will into the circumstances. Now, there was nothing wrong in taking the job, but I was wrong to assume based on the circumstances that I knew God's plan for me because God put these circumstances into effect so we know what God wants, which is what they were telling David. Um, also, what Saul believed, you know, when, uh, when David went to Keilah, then Saul said, wow, look at the circumstances. God has given him into my hands. But that wasn't true either. Um, and by the way, the abuse of the principle, touch not the Lord's anointed, by some in the word faith and the charismatic Pentecostal movement, is very poor in its exegesis of Scripture. David did not mean that he would not say anything against the Lord's anointed. He did not mean he would not criticize Saul. He merely meant... He would not do anything physical against him, such as killing him. Um, so if a minister of God falls into heresy or into sin, you ought not to kill him. But um, notice that David's heart struck him because he cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Um, what, what a sensitive conscience. Um, we would not have thought that. We would have thought he might have been a little proud of himself because he resisted and did the right thing. But um, even that struck his, struck his, uh, conscience, his conscience, struck him. And uh, clearly David valued God's approval more than anything else. Um, more than gaining the promised kingdom or gaining it early. Um, more than defending his own life. And so David persuaded his men and restrain them also. Undoubtedly, they were eager to put an end to Saul. They must have thought David was crazy. Uh, how, how could he not take the opportunity that God was so obviously giving him? But David restrained them. Uh, note, however, that Saul had no problem putting the Lord's anointed de to death. Uh, David was anointed for the throne, and Saul knew this. And the priests of Nob were all anointed by the Lord as priests. And Saul killed them all and was seeking to kill David. Verse 8. Now afterward David arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, saying, My Lord the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the ground and prostrated himself. If his men thought David crazy before, they were sure of it now. By calling out to Saul, David put his life and the life of his men, seemingly or pragmatically speaking, into Saul's hand. Saul could summon his men and put an end to David and his band. So why was David so brave? 
David saw in God's actions what even his men missed. God is in full control. Both David's life and Saul's life are fully in God's hand to do with as he pleases. So God trusted, I mean, excuse me, so David trusted God with his life and with his future. Neither his life nor the promise of the throne were things that David was willing to grasp as though his grip could attain them or keep them. So David bows to Saul and shows proper respect to his king who was anointed by Yahweh. And Saul was so stunned that he just stood there and listened, no doubt with his mouth hanging open. Um, verse 9, And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men, saying, Behold, David seeks to do you evil? Here David shows some grace to Saul by not laying the blame directly on him. It was mostly Saul's own ideas that caused him to pursue David. But David graciously lays the blame on Saul's counselors, perhaps making it easier for him to repent. Uh, verse 10, Behold, this day your eyes have seen that Yahweh had given you today into my hand in the cave. And some said to kill you, but my eye had pity on you. And I said, I will not send forth my hand against my Lord, for he is the anointed of Yahweh. Undeniably, it was indeed Yahweh who had given Saul into the hand of David. This was far beyond any possibility of coincidence. David was given bad advice also, but he refused to listen to them, or else Saul would be dead. Rather than grasping at the throne that he had himself been anointed to ascend, David prefers to trust God and follow his will. Verse 11, Now my father see, indeed, see the edge of your robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the edge of your robe and did not kill you, know and see that there is no evil or transgression in my hand, and I have not sinned against you, though you are lying in wait for my life to take it. What stunning proof that David was close enough to have killed Saul, and stunning proof that David had no desire to kill Saul. Saul seems to be left temporarily speechless. David contrasts his own righteous intent with Saul's unjust intent. You are lying in wait for my life to take it. The fact that he called him my father is just a courtesy. Um, but there is something about the robe that we should notice. The king's robe was a symbol of kingship his authority over the kingdom. Um, remember what Samuel said to Saul when he tore Samuel's robe. Yahweh has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. David's cutting off of a corner of Saul's robe was intended by God as a symbol of the kingdom being cut away from Saul and given to David. Verse 12, May Yahweh judge between you and me and may Yahweh avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. So David is saying that he's leaving it with God, and he will not be the one to settle the matter. David said, or excuse me, David reminds Saul that David is not alone in this struggle between the two of them, that Yahweh will judge between them and will avenge David, but David's hand will not be against Saul. If Saul had any doubts before about Yahweh's active involvement in these matters, that's cleared up now. Not even Saul could deny that the, the situation of him being put in that cave was God's doing. Verse 13, as the proverb of the ancients says, Out of the wicked comes forth wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. This this proverb David actually applies to himself and leaves Saul to apply it to himself by reflection. David repeats, my hand shall not be against you. He wants to drive home that point. Verse 14, after whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom are you pursuing? After a dead dog or after a single flea? This is David expressing how little of a threat he is to Saul and asking why the king of Israel is so obsessed as to gather 3,000 choice men and pursue this single flea all across the country. Verse 15, Therefore Yahweh be judge and execute justice between you and me, and may he see and plead my cause and execute justice 
for me to escape from your hand. And by the way, David needed that help and that escape right at that moment because Saul could definitely have called his men and that would have been the end of David and his, his band. If David can powerfully pluck Saul out from among his army and put him helplessly into the presence of David and his men, he can surely uh, cause David to escape from Saul's hand. David trusts in God to judge and execute justice and plead his cause and deliver him. It's such a contrast here between how David trusts God and how Saul trusts in everything else, his men and his, uh, his decisions to kill various people and everything else. Verse 16, Now it happened that when David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? Then David, then Saul, rather, lifted up his voice and wept. All of this overwhelmed Saul, and he wept. Uh, notice that he says, My son David, whereas until now he called him the son of Jesse. Um, verse 17, and he said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have dealt well with me, while I have dealt evil with you. While recognizing David's righteousness, Saul initially reveals the shallowness of his own repentance. He doesn't say, you have been righteous, but I have been wicked, uh, which would have been true. But instead, he still thinks he's been righteous, just not as righteous as David. Um, but Saul does admit that he has dealt evil with David, while David has dealt well with him. Verse 18, and you have declared today that you have done good to me, that Yahweh surrendered me into your hand, and yet you did not kill me. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safely? May Yahweh therefore reward you with good in return for what you have done to me this day. Even with sin, having twisted his thinking so many times before, the obvious uh, nature of God's working here and of David's righteous behavior cannot be denied. Saul blesses David with hope for Yahweh's reward of good in return from what David did for Saul this day. And verse 20, So now behold, I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hand. We knew in an earlier chapter that Jonathan had said that Saul knows that David will be king. And now Saul admits it himself. Only now Saul admits it in such a way as to be resigned to it. At least it would seem that way. Verse 21, So now swear to me by Yahweh that you will not cut off my seed after me and that you will not destroy my name from my father's household. So David swore to Saul. In this time and place in the world and earlier, going back centuries, the most important thing a man could do was leave behind a line of descendants. Um... Saul asked David to swear that he will not wipe out Saul's descendants. David agreed and swore this to Saul because he happened to love Jonathan and had already made a covenant with him. Um, so David was not about to wipe out Jonathan, who was Saul's son. Continuing, and Saul went to his home, but David and his men went up to the fortress. You might think now that Saul and David were reconciled and David would go back with Saul to the palace, and everything would be good. Um, but that was not the case. Uh, David was wise enough to know that Saul would likely change his mind again and once more decide to kill him. Two chapters later, we will see that Saul repeats this foolishness, and with the same humbling result. So, some takeaways to consider. A hard heart can be repentant for a time. Uh, David's kindness brought sorrow and, and repentance and weeping to Saul. Um, but his hardness of heart was deeper than his repentance, and so the repentance did not last. Um, and so we should look to our own hearts and uh, our own repentance um, and, and be aware that uh, only the power of God can soften a hard heart. Um, 
So my question is, what are you grasping? Are you trusting God fully? Or are you trying to attain what you value the most and hold on to it by the power of your own grip? Um, and first and foremost, have you trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior? Uh, Matthew 16, 25 says, For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Um, so even coming to Christ for salvation, um, we cannot be grasping our life at the same time. We have to give that up to him and trust in him fully. Uh, Christ is the ultimate anointed one, anointed for messianic service, anointed for sacrificial death, and anointed to be the final everlasting king of Israel and the world, since Israel will inherit the world. And he was delivered up by the Father to die and endure the penalty that our sins deserved. Uh, Jesus sees our case, pleads our case, and, and with his death, and delivers us in salvation if we believe in him. Um, probably the most famous verse in all the Bible, John 3.16. Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Um, but for us who have trusted in Christ, we can still find at times that we are grasping at something of value instead of trusting God to provide for us. It's easy to do. We are still sinners by nature, and we still need God to continue to remind us and to sanctify us um, as long as we remain in this mortal life. While we aspire to be like David in this chapter, we can easily be like Saul. Um, I know how easily I can. And um, so if you, find, if you find yourself grasping instead of trusting God alone, think of David and Saul and remember that God loves his children and will absolutely fulfill all his promises. Um, Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you to be gathered here together in your name and to worship you. We ask God that uh, your word would uh, uh, have deep roots in our hearts and bear much fruit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.